Hello, everybody. Um, this is the second video. We're talking about cultural values. That's the second second uh, part on the PowerPoint. It's a little bit long. I'm going to try to summarize it, not talk super long. And the first thing I want to mention are stereotypes and generalizations. Here's the rule, and you can see some of these down here. Stereotypes are bad, whether they're true or not, most of the time whether they're uh, um, positive stereotypes or negative stereotypes. Why? Because, because you encounter an individual or a group that you think's from a certain group, or you think you know about them, and you have this, what I call a generalization in your head. You may say, this pe the people from group Y are excellent cooks, or they're great poets or they're pickpockets, or they're dishonest, or they don't like us. You have any of these assumptions, positive or negative, when you encounter the group, and then that generalization, as soon as you apply it to them, you're stereotyping, because you don't know them. Even though you think you do, these discussions are excellent. Um, I remember one discussion this weekend, and I've only done the uh, first group, so I'm going to do the other ones starting today, going through all your discussions. But one of the really good ones, um, oh, now I forgot. Uh, I'll have to give another example. I forget things. Um, is, uh, oh, yes, now I remember. A lady uh, approached uh, some people speaking in an accent, I think it's Filipino, uh, in a grocery store. And some of you will know what I'm talking about, and you'll know if you wrote it. And they followed them around saying, why don't you speak English? And why don't these people speak English? And drew attention to them. And so you understand the lady had stereotyped them and thought they were speaking Spanish and were not learning to speak English. And so she followed them around the store. I think this is really getting on the edge. I would be having a serious problem with that lady. Hopefully she was mentally ill, but she probably was just a racist. She was in stage two, okay? Uh, I'll be nice. Um, so uh, she thought anyone she met who didn't, who spoke with an accent or spoke differently, was Hispanic. That was their stereotype. Okay? This is an extreme example of real tacky in a racist person. So, what do we say with this? Um, if you encounter someone from another country and you insist they do something or be a certain way or dress a certain way, then you've stereotyped them. Even if even if what you're doing is not particularly negative, maybe you compliment them. Uh, you know, you go up to them and say, you Germans, you really have a very clean, uh, you keep really nice roads and nice streets, and that's gonna be embarrassing. You're attributing to them something that doesn't have anything to do with them. That's why stereotypes are bad. Um, um, the one where someone was hiring people and said, well, their English isn't very good, so they can only be the people that wash dishes in a restaurant or do this or do that or some other kind of work. They can't, they can't do anything more than that. Stereotyping. Stereotyping is not, of course, ethnic. It could be through to people of disabilities, people of different uh, sexual orientation. It could be um, um, women. And uh, since a lot of you in the class are, are women, you would know times that people have treated you like you don't know, or maybe you can't be a principal, or maybe you can't be a superintendent, or you can't be in charge of something. Somebody else, said, somebody older has to be in charge. That's another one. Older people are smart. Now, I, of course, agree with that now. I like that stereotype. I like being stereotyped now when I get a benefit from it. But the fact is, it's really not good. You don't want to go up to somebody and say, you people are really good at whatever, that's an insult because you're not seeing them as an individual. 
And this will lead you to the conclusion, almost all comedy is bad. It's very dangerous. I, you know, the more I think about it, I love comedy. But in fact, comedy is pretty darn hurtful. I know people say, oh, there's clean comics. They're very nice. But there's a certain level of cruelty in the way people think. And uh, that's why it's very dangerous to be sarcastic with students or people you don't know or to tell jokes. So I'm being real careful on here, you know, this is on YouTube, so. So you don't want to stereotype people. That's what I, that's my, my deal about the generalization. Generalizations aren't bad, but when you open your mouth and apply them, you stereotype, so keep them in here, not in here. Okay, what are cultural values? What is right, what's wrong, what's moral, what's valuable, what's important? Um, so that's what values and cultural values or orientations we call them are general beliefs. Now generalizations, as I just mentioned, do exist. And you're gonna have those. You're gonna have some kind of generalization about people from Japan or China or Western Iowa or or Kansas or Arkansas or Texans or Floridians or South Americans. Wherever you are from in the world, you're going to have some concept of other groups, unless you encounter someone you never have no history with. You have no way to know. Um, so we have to have some kind of a way of thinking about it. I call it a schema. It's kind of like the way, you, but of course, it's a schema, uh, the way you organize your thinking about a certain thing. In particular, I'm talking about people or cultures. Uh, you, you're going to have to educate yourself because they're almost certainly going to be misunderstood. If you've ever had somebody treat you in a certain way that upset you, even even if it wasn't assaulting necessarily, you know what I mean. Value orientations. And it talks in here on the PowerPoints of frame number four and talks about value orientations. And all it's saying here is that There'll be a decision by most of the people within a group on certain things that they're going to behave a certain way or the things have to be a certain way, okay? Uh, for example, and one of the examples is the right next door, individual versus collectivism. Some cultures, and I'm talking, uh, I'll, I'll use Japan for example. I don't think this would be construed as negative in any way, but most people see individualism as a negative thing in Japanese culture, among Japanese. It's important to reach a consensus. It's important to be a part of the group. Going off on your own and being individual is not a plus. Now, I have seen Japanese that are not part of the collectivism attitude. What is collectivism? It means group, you know. Another example is football team. Football cannot be played if you're going to, going to do it individually, unless you're Terrell Owens. <laughs> okay, sorry. I had to stick that dig in. Um, but the deal is that team is number one, and you hear this all the time in football. You know, we're a team. Uh, one guy can't win the game on his own. Uh, you may claim they can, and I know LeBron in basketball is very good and makes a huge impact, but still, he can't win with just anybody. He has to have a good team with him. Uh, but certain cultures, you are ostracized if you're not part of the team. Uh, I've seen this. Um, uh, I've seen individuals from Japan that I've dealt with over the years that uh, did their own thing. and. They just weren't part of the group. Had this guy worked with years ago. He was into trout. He was into fly fishing. And when I say he's into fly fishing, his English wasn't very good, but his knowledge of vocabulary in English of fly fishing was perfect. He knew everything about fly fishing. When, he, when they went to Colorado in this group, all the other Japanese students went out and went to this lake and they did the things. They drank some beer and they did other things. They had a good time. They were all together, but not uh, 
uh, Hero, I, I don't remember his full name, but Hero would go out and go fishing by himself in a pond or a stream. And he never did things with the other students because he had nothing in common with them. He was atypical. He was different. Delightful guy. And uh, he now, I think, works for a company in Japan. He takes uh, businessmen from Japan on trips to Canada and the United States to go fly fishing. Because fishing is a big, uh, big sport. And so that's their vacation. You know, wealthy men want to go somewhere and he takes them and he makes sure everything's done properly. So he was atypical. Now, let's shift this to uh, Europeans. This idea of individualism depends on what you mean by it. Some people take it to extremes, but it means that if you have students in your class, and you notice that most of the students do a certain thing, like they're in a certain group. Uh, maybe you have a class of kids that are all into poetry and they really like art or they're goths. You know, they wear the dark paint or something. I won't, I don't know much about that. Um, or, or they're into sports. But then you got the one kid in the school that's different. Uh, maybe that kid, uh, for whatever reason, they're different. They're an individual, whatever the reason is. And um, so Americans like to think of ourselves, and I'm speaking as an American, I think I know this, that we like to say that we're individuals and I control my own fate, you know, that um, I may have a relationship with God or, you know, certain beliefs, but I think largely I'm self-reliant. And I'm, I'll give you an example from history, mountain men, the pioneers. Pioneers are not people sit around waiting, saying, we're all in New Hampshire around the maple syrup. I don't know if we should go. Let's wait until everybody decides they want to go together. Well, they would never have gone. Those people stayed in New Hampshire or Vermont or wherever they were. And so you have individuals and you have collectivism. So that's, that's a nice set of terms to describe. You can actually use those to describe your students or groups within your students about that issue of individualism. In some cultures, it, Here's an interesting thing. If you are teaching using differentiation and you go to certain cultures overseas, I had this, I was told, I think it was Japanese, but it also could have been in China too. I was told that if you use differentiation, it won't be accepted. And I was puzzled because I thought, well, this differentiating, you know, helping people at their level with different types of assignments. They said, no, if you give a different assignment, everybody's going to get upset. Everybody must do the same thing. Now, I'm sure it's not that simple that you can differentiate, but, but I was basically told, reprimanded, whatever, that this idea is great in the United States, but if you try it in our country, you will just be in a lot of trouble. You can't do it. So when you talk about individual and you start bringing individual needs, then it doesn't work. So if you teach ESL in other countries, you're going to, have to be very subtle about it or disguise it or something. Okay, another value, small power, large power distance. Generally speaking, from the American viewpoint, we like to think that nobody's better than us, that we're equal. Now, I don't think that's true at all because money makes a huge difference and, and wealth and status makes a huge difference. Uh, celeb being a celebrity. So I don't buy that, but small power means that you're close to impacting changes in your community. Whereas large power means that the individual is not too important. It's whoever the leader is. They're way over the top. I would say in North Korea, it is 199% large power distance. Kim, the leader of North Korea, couldn't care a bit about what an individual might think. So I can't even show you how extreme that is. Whereas people would say in, say, Denmark or in uh, certain countries in Europe that, um, that the political politicians are not that far above you. Okay. And I would say that shifted in the United States. I mean, we have a lot of physical distance. And um, we worship celebrities, and we know 
you know, somebody's president or somebody's a senator or something, you know, do you just go up there and rip into them if you don't like them? I say you probably don't because I think we have much greater power distance than we think. We like to think that we can just tell our politicians what to do. My theory is that that's not true, but that's my theory, okay? Um, I would venture and I would um, I would venture to say that in the military, there's a hierarchy and you have to follow the hierarchy. I don't know all the inner rules of the military. I'm sure there's a lot of hidden rules, but uh, in any organization, whether it's a company or a school system, you know that maybe that principal or superintendent is so far away that they're untouchable. And you just have to follow the rules or get out. You don't have a choice. I like that movie, Get Out. You know, I've seen that movie, it kind of creeps me out. Uh, value orientation continuums, a lot of big words. Great word for Scrabble continuum, double U's. You can get rid of those U's. Remember that. Um, Low context and high context society. Low context in that society means that you can observe and see what the rules are because they're almost written on the walls. Uh, some cultures, everything's written. You will do this, you will not do that. And the rules are all set up. So a person who's from the outside who knows the language can fo follow, you know. I would say maybe in Germany it's like that, but I don't know, I've been to Germany. Um, but some are very high context. Now, when I say cultures and nations, that's one thing. It can be true in an organization, a school. A person can go in a school and think, oh yeah, I can, I can go over and complain about this certain teacher in the other room. And then you find out later that they're related to the superintendent or a school board member. And that when you do this complaining, you just really screwed up because, uh, you didn't know the context. And so I would say that's high context. High context means you really have to study the situation, observe to see what's really going on. Uh, when you go to another culture, or even as I said, a company organization, a school, whatever it is, and you constantly screw up and get in trouble because you, you, don't, you don't know what's going on, that's because you're in high context. The rules are not written down on, on a wall that you can just figure them out and, and follow them. You know, we do, the United States is what I call somewhat low context. We have lots of signs. If you're driving, we got signs, hey, here, here. But you go into a rural part of the United States and someone says, you go down past that second dirt road, you know, the one by the large tree, and you take a right, and then you go down, oh, we go down a stone's throw or so and you make another left, and then you're listening and then you're thinking, only a person who lives here would be able to find their way around. That's high context. Only a person who knows the situation has lived there is gonna really understand what's going on. So you may, when you go in, you can talk about this term, low context, high context, okay? And again, I would say uh, certain places, uh, we're pretty careful in our society. We like to think we put up signs about everything. You know, don't go down that alley, dead end, or, you know, rules for your school. School is generally, even though it can have high context, we try to treat it like, I'm going to put down every rule so that everybody knows what the rules are. Nobody can screw up. Now, what's interesting is people don't always read the rule book. Low context societies have lots of rules. Doesn't mean people read them. Okay, now another one. Man and nature. This is a great one because if you live in a rural state, you know that even Nebraska football must bend before nature. Farmers do not farm regardless of what's going on outside. If it rains, they can't do anything. If it's lightning, well, they might go outside and listen to the radio with a lightning rod on the tractor. But mastery over nature is, has been historically a big issue in human civilization. We can make canals. We can make the Panama Canal. We can, we can drill down and we can use irrigation and we can grow great crops despite the lack of rain in Nebraska or in Arizona or wherever it is. 
we can overcome nature. Some things in nature we can't overcome, and you know what those are, tornadoes. Nobody goes around saying, yeah, we're going to block those tornadoes, or no, you just run like hell and hide when there's a tornado, because there's nothing you can do about it. Same thing with hurricanes, you just try to survive. So some nature can be controlled. Animals, uh, for a long time, a lot of the mountain lions were not even seen. And a few years ago in Nebraska, a few years ago, we had a mountain lion go all the way to an elementary school area in, in Kearney, and the police shot it. They upset me they shot it, but they probably didn't know what else to do. I mean, it's not like you can get them to jump in your car and you can drive them outside of town and let them out. It was a mountain lion. Um, but animals are very vulnerable because we can master animals. Not ants, not termites. That's a whole different ballgame. Not in, but we're killing bees. So, I mean, we are part of the environment just like the other animals are. And some th animals, we, we do a lot of, uh, we eliminate them, we drive them out, we control them, we grow them for food, etc. But, and we try to do the same with the land, but weather is something we don't have much control of. So, subjugation to nature and mastery over nature. So, some cultures, we tend to say they live in harmony with nature. You know, you've heard the, used to be we'd had this joke about hippies who go out and say, I'm just going to be cool, man. I'm going to live with nature. And I'm just going to, you know, whatever grows in nature, I'll smoke it or whatever. Um, the history of human civilization is such that things like mountains, you couldn't do a whole lot about. Yeah, you could put a railroad through a mountain, but you couldn't get rid of the mountains. So there's some limited control there. But uh, sometimes you were controlled by nature. As I mentioned, the tornadoes, floods, et cetera, you try to control that. Um, so that's something that when you look at other cultures and you see, oh, they're from, they're parts of, say, the country of Guatemala, where it's so wild that even people don't live in those parts very much. It's too... It's a jungle, they can't even overcome it. And they may someday, if unfortunately cut down too much of it, but it just really depends. So value orientation over nature. Um, nature is also the things that kill us, disease. We are always fighting disease. Uh, cancer existed thousands of years ago, it's not just now. And so it's part of, I guess, what we call the organic or natural process, it's nature. And so we're constantly fighting with nature. We want to live as long as we can live. So you can see about these forces. Uh, value orientation on time. Wow, that's a great one. Monochronic, polychronic. You know, we have all those used to be date calendars. You'd buy them at the bookstore or something. Now we got them on our computer. Alarm goes off. Oh, I got to go to physical therapy. I got to get up. I got to go to school got to get up at a certain time in the morning because school starts at eight o'clock or seven o'clock if you're a band person, etc. In some cultures, um, it's more important to have to spend time talking to people than to be on time. In other words, the fact I'm doing this video and I'm concerned about how long I'm going to talk on here. That is, a, that is a, if I talk longer, it means I'm more concerned about talking to you than I am just trying to cut this off and make a second video. Um, and yet, I, my sister-in-law, she will, if she's going somewhere, she may not, Linda may not get back to the house for two hours, even though she just went to the convenience store to get a pizza or something for everybody. People say, what happened? Does she have an act? No, she just ran into people and she talks to them. Some cultures value that. It's more important to talk to people than to be in a big hurry, okay? Again, Seinfeld, you remember when he's seen his uncle Leo, and he said, oh, I, I saw you downtown. I was, in, I was doing something. And uncle Leo says, what? What, Jerry? You didn't have time to, to say hello? You didn't have to come across the street and just say hi, talk to me a little bit? And, of course, he's always fighting. He doesn't want to talk to his uncle Leo because he won't shut up. And so you get those circumstances. I know because you talk to relatives on the phone, you can't get them off the phone. Or maybe they can't get you off the phone. Or maybe you want to get me off this video. I don't know. But, but the deal is that some people are monochronic. Hey, 
they do this at seven, we do this at eight, we do this at nine. School is organized that way. We try to organize kids that way. But their sleep patterns of being a teenager is more polychronic, you know? So there's a conflict there in time. Uh, uh, people complain you go to a rural area and boy, everybody doesn't show up exactly on time. Some cultures showing up on time is an insult. You're not even supposed to show up till an hour later. So uh, I learned that I went, I was in Costa Rica and I went to a party right at seven. And of course nobody showed up till 8.30. And I actually embarrassed myself by showing up early. It was like, oh, we're still cleaning. What are you doing here? Oh, well, I thought you said seven. Well, that was insulting. Like, hey, you kind of misled me. So I learned very quickly that you just, you're real mellow and you show up whenever the time right. Future and present, and um, that's a good one. Carpe diem, that means seize the day. Let's go for it. Let's party right now, or let's do what we need to do right now. Hey, I got a notion. It'd be great. Let's just stop for now. Let's go. You know, if I if I were to stop now and, and go out and leave this video running for a couple of minutes and then come back, you'd think, what the heck's he doing? My time's valuable. I can't sit here and look at this rich and cultured room. Um, uh, future orientation. I'm saving for the future. I'm saving, I mean, I'm saving money for the future. I have all these goals I want to accomplish. And that's, that's a, some cultures are more future and others more present. Now, it's not that simple, of course, because the future may mean other things. It may mean, uh, hope for the future, maybe a really distant future, as opposed to, you know, two years from now, I'm going to get my degree, and three years from now, I'm going to get married, and then I'm going to have kids in five years, and, and that's just boom, boom, boom. That's a very, what we call Western, even American attitude, but not all Americans are that way. It depends on what culture you're in. So you have to think, future, you know, as I go through all these, these are like, monitors on a on a gauge and you can move them back and forth for whatever culture you're encountering how can these value orientations be used well to think about and you need to compare and some of you said you know when you temple grand and stuff it kind of dawned on you oh no i didn't realize this or or maybe with the new faces on main street you realize oh you know this um stereotypes I have are really hurtful and harmful and, and people are very racist. You know that one with the light, they said, oh, we think people like you, we eat uh, some kind of animal or something. She said, no, we don't, we don't eat dogs. We don't do that. Why do you think that? And so it's a shock. And so the values, values about food, values about family, values about time, values about the future, values about space, values about noise. You know, uh, people say, oh, those guys are really noisy. I've been reading uh, incidents where it was on a train where some people were kicked off the train because they were too noisy. And this became a very serious civil rights racial issue. And it's because one group, uh, their normal social interaction was loud. And the other groups thought this was abnormal. We can't have this. It's, you know, they weren't in a library. I'm sorry. They're on a train. And so this was way over the top, ejecting these people, kicking them out. So uh, that's the same as uh, silence, the sounds of silence. Sometimes when people are silent, you think nothing's happening. But lots of things are happening because you don't realize it. Okay. All right. Uh, cultural miscommunication. Intense observation. I actually have a series of books, and they're called um, from an intercultural press, and you'll have to look up the name of the band. Uh, I don't know if I can find it that quickly. I think I have it here. It's called uh, uh, what? a couple of them in here. Sorry. One's called The Hispanic Way. And it's called uh, Aspects of Behavior, Attitudes, and Customs in the Spanish-Speaking World. And I actually have this for 
Thailand and for Arab countries. And uh, talks about, these are great books, The Hispanic Way. I'll have to put them on a list if you want to. If this is something that would be really valuable for you. And if you're working with people that there is no book, maybe you should write the book. I'm thinking of the Karen uh, refugees from Myanmar and Thailand, that area. All the rules about their society. Uh, communication, marriage, education, gift giving. Gift giving's big. You know, you think somebody's bribing you when they're just being nice. Not accepting gifts is an insult in a lot of places. Oh, thank you, but I can't accept that. That's a really big insult. It's not like they're offering you cash. Now, I had a student from Pakistan gave me a beautiful leather coat. In fact, it was so fresh, this was years ago, that my dog tried to eat it because part of it hadn't cured yet. There was some lump in it that wasn't cured. And I know my dog would run in the closet and try to try to find where the meat was. I, I thought that's probably why it got it discounted, you know. It had to hang in the closet for several years before, you know, became beef jerky was left in the back, I think. Um, no, uh, by the way, value orientations don't explain everything, okay? They just explain some things. And so, um, so there may be psychological issues. There may be personal experiences or trauma they've gone through. There may be a conflict in the family. They may not be educated uh, very well or educated in a way that's different. They may have a religious belief that has really different uh, not all Christians have a similar way of, of behaving or acting, or some are much more strict and some have certain rules. I mean, what if you get somebody who's a COPT from Egypt, Coptic? It's one of the earliest religions in Christianity, version of uh, Christianity. I was reading a thing last night and said the Coptics actually speak Egyptian. That's old Egyptian, which I did not know. That was really cool. It's not Arabic, I knew that, and it predated. It's not Latin and it's not Roman, so it had to be related to the language of uh, Cleopatra. I did not know that. I'm gonna have to listen to some of that. COPT, if you ever wanna look that up. Uh, religious beliefs, rural background, urban background, ethnic identity, degree of assimilation or acculturation in living environment in the country. Okay, so I've got a list of things there. I'm giving you a lot of general things in an 804 class, but I really want to give you more specifics because I think it makes it more interesting. Now, I hope this has been helpful. Now, you just think about these things, future and past orientation uh, or present orientation, actually the past. Some cultures are very rooted in the past. Monochronic, polychronic, how time is used, whether is time the most important thing or relationships. Uh, man and nature. What is your attitude? I have a lot of plants, so I believe I can subjugate plants and force them to grow in my pots around here and they'll make me happy. Now some of them die I don't, and I don't know why and then I get little bugs in them which are part of nature. I hate the little bugs. I try to kill them with sprays and they just keep coming back. Um, low context, high context. Um, all kinds of little thing. You know, I saw, I was watching a video last night and was talking about really unusual languages. There's a language in, uh, I forget the place, I think it was in, I think it was in some place in South America. People whistle to each other to communicate. They do have language, but they can do incredibly detailed whistles that can be heard like two miles. <clears throat> because they don't have telephones, they don't have telephones, you know, long distance on a mountain, you can't just climb across a mountain so you can get close enough to chat. Say so whistle stuff, and people say, oh, no, I understand. And this had developed, it was the damnedest thing I've ever seen. Um, people have uh, clicking sounds. There are, there are languages in certain parts of the world, the South Pacific, and, or maybe even in the combinations of those in Africa. And you hear people going up. 
and it's weird and then some of them make sounds they can't even make but uh the clicking is part of the uh conversation and you think oh it's not a vowel i said it's just a click how does that work well it works um so low context high context um a lot of times this is the way things are um one example i do recall was that when a man and a woman wanted to get married and it kind of an old older japan not now but the 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 daughter i think it would be the daughter's mother would go and have a dinner with the husband future potential husband's mother and they would be served food and if a certain thing was not offered to them that meant that she did not approve of the marriage so there was none of this no i don't want my daughter to marry you know you see a sitcom in the united states oh, i don't want him to marry that she's not good enough for my boy no they wouldn't do anything like that they just simply a certain thing i thought it was a pickle or uh, some kind of a fruit or a vegetable would not be offered and if it wasn't offered that was a sign that the marriage was not going to be accepted by the other family talk about very extreme high context if you don't know about what you're being served you're just sitting there it's just food no it's not just food it has significance uh think about communion uh people depending on their belief whether it's the blood of christ you know, uh, or the body of christ or or symbolic or however you want to treat that it has high context it's not a snack okay and so people get very upset about that if it's not you know people are treat communion in a, in a like some kind of a dinner it's it it's not okay small power distance large power distance if you guys are all scared of me and i'm like all powerful professor and you're intimidated by me and you dare not do anything that might flunk you that's high power if you think that you can call up and say, yeah, Dr. Tracy, I've got a problem with him. You better straighten it out. That's called small power. And that makes me very small. Okay. I'm having fun. Uh, finally, individualism, collectivism. Um, depends on the situation. But some many cultures or even, like I said, organizations uh, or certain uh, religions or something, depending on how they organize, can be very um, a small power or individual or uh, well, I'm sorry that's small power but it can emphasize the individual over the group if the group this is the way you have to believe or is this and I'm in a class and everybody's studying biology and this is how we believe uh, what I'm teaching about biology and you decide you don't want to agree with that like say you reject evolution that's individualism. That means you're breaking away from the group. <coughs> Make it the same with uh, laws or anything else. And some societies don't tolerate that much individualism. You become ostracized and you're put outside. In extreme societies, you're destroyed. So you know that if you're in the old, uh, uh, you're in the old Soviet Union under Stalin. And you decided one day, I think Stalin's nuts. You know, I don't believe in Stalin or I don't believe in the Communist Party. You're going to be sent to a prison in Gulag and probably die. Nobody will see you again. So being an individual in that context is deadly. Um, okay, I hope this has been somewhat useful to you. I'm sorry it's been a little long. I wanted to get this stuff to you. Thank you. And I'll put up the discussion later, okay? And it's just going to basically be what I put on the assignment sheet.